Weeks and uh, former development director for the theater and now president emeritus um, for Friend of the Sanger. And I am here visiting with Doug Lee, who is the general manager of the Sanger Theater here in Pensacola, Florida. It's the summer of 2011, and it also happens to be Doug's 30th anniversary of working here in the facility. That's quite a long time, um, and I actually knew you back in 1981, and I came here in 1983 for a few years, and the rest of it's been completely a volunteer situation, but you have worked your way up through the ranks, so to speak, and I just, I wanted to spend some time um, sharing with Pensacolians, with anybody that might be interested in theater, um, particular with uh, older theaters, um, because you have such a wealth of knowledge about the Sanger, about what's happened, so um, I'm going to try to be quiet, it's hard for me to do, um, having a little bit of a TV background, and, and, and with that, it's such a medium that, that I love that I, I felt like if people could just tune in and listen and, and hear some of the history, they might just have fun. So I hope it'll be informative and enjoyable to just have a conversation with Doug. So, hi, Doug. Hi. <laughs> I appreciate you doing this for us to, today. Yeah. Uh, you know, the Sanger has been around since 1925. It was built par or partly from uh, remnants of the Pensacola Opera House. Uh, back behind us you can see the balcony railing that came out of the opera house as well as most of the brick that was used to build the building. So the idea that we're recycling here in 2012, 2011 yeah, yeah. is kind of old because really that's been going on in Pensacola for a long time. Uh, so our building was built really as a vaudeville movie palace. Uh, it had silent movies. The first movie shown here was Cecil B. DeMille's Ten Commandments. It was the silent version, not the one with Charlton oh. Heston, but the silent version. Okay. Uh, that's the one they actually used jello and a fan to make the effect of the parting of the Red Sea. Oh, that's right. They, they held up uh -huh. um, a fan <laughs> against jello and yeah. then a mirror so that it, uh -huh. it showed the, the, the sea parting. Yeah. Uh, it was a great effect for the day, especially. Sure, in 1925, that was great. Uh, and it shown here on the actual silver screen. The, the original screen was actually made of silver uh, impregnated into the screen, silver dust, and it shown on the, uh, the, the screen then. And that was for its reflective quality? Yes, that was, you know, white back then wasn't pure enough, so they actually used silver as a reflective surface for the, the movie screens at the time. Somebody might was, not have known that, you know, that that's how you got the silver screen name. That's exactly right. Mm -hmm. uh, this was actually one of the first buildings in downtown that was built with all electric. Oh. Uh, this building was actually piped for natural gas lighting in case electricity was a passing trend. <laughs> There's still evidence of it within, mm -hmm. within the building we've discovered during the renovations. Really? Uh, and so, you know, it kind of shows that progress, you know, and what maybe you know electricity didn't end up being an eight track player mm -hmm. uh that we all remember from our <laughs> youth uh, don't tell anybody that that. Uh, that our you know failed technologies mm -hmm. this building has actually stood the test of time and, and invested well in technology uh, the building was originally built without air conditioning mm -hmm. uh, and was actually built to hold about two thousand people initially uh, and now with uh, America getting wider, we've added more width to the seats and we're down to about 1,600 seats in the theater. Everybody's gotten wider but me. I could still sit in those little seats, right? That's right. <laughs> That's right. Of course, you're still 20 years old. Exactly. So. That's it. Uh, I started working here when I was negative 10. <laughs> That's right. So, um, uh, anyway, no, people have gotten wider and, and, you know, there was some, actually a little bit of concern about um, about that, but didn't sight lines improve and, and that kind of thing? And, and a lot of the seats, when the theater was switched over and became more of a, a performing arts center, some of the seats couldn't be used. Isn't that right? In the uh, in the late uh, 70s, early 80s, during the first renovation, uh, we actually were able to restore the seats that were in here and use them over. Uh, in the more recent renovation. Uh, we had to take all of those seats out. We found the, that the company, however, that made them in 1925 was still in existence and was still able to reproduce the original seats from the original molds they used in the 20s, which is a great historic That's fabulous. mold. fabulous, yeah. Um, 
in the 40s, the theater was modernized. Okay. Uh, they added air conditioning. Mm -hmm. It did not have air conditioning before the 40s. Right, hot. Um, they tore off the box seats off the sides of the wall, the upper box seats, okay. because they put in widescreen movies, cinemascope movies. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. uh, and the box seats, of course, catch a shadow on the screen. Mm -hmm. So they had increased the size of the screen, they tore the box seats off, and they put in modern, in the 40s, uh, movie theater seats on the downstairs portion of the theater. Okay. The upstairs remained with its original seats and had those until just a couple of years ago. Okay. So what was more modern about the seats downstairs? Uh, they were just typical 40s movie theater seats. Uh -huh. um, okay. They um, Just a little more updated than, than what had been there previously. Yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. Wasn't there something about um, some metal um, shortages or needing more metal or something, or am I thinking of something wrong that in relation to the seats? Well, the, the, the style of those seats uh -huh. uh, ended up being made uh, out of... Um, a lower grade metal uh -huh. for the, the castings okay. of the seats. Instead uh -huh. of being cast iron, they were a lower grade okay. because obviously all the steel production in the U.S. was going toward the war effort at the time. Uh -huh. uh, the theater was modernized partly because the Navy yard here was operating 24 hours a day in three shifts, and they ran the theater 24 hours a day to accommodate the people that were working those other shifts. Oh. So they ran movies mm -hmm. all day, mm -hmm. 24 hours a day, to accommodate those various shifts. Right here. Right here. Right where we're sitting. Yes. The screen came down and all the people viewed um, newsreels too, right? Yeah, newsreels, uh, films of the day. Um, it was the you know the information outlet. It was the internet of its day. You sure. came down, you watched the newsreels. Uh, you got some information on the radio, but you got no images. Sure. And so that was the way of the audience here could connect with their family, friends, uh, sons that were overseas fighting the war. So what a great service that Lady Sanger provided during wartime and, and, and for this whole community, for our naval community, if nothing else. That's, you know, I, I think I do remember because I've helped do a documentary that, that, that we talked about people coming here to see the newsreels, but I don't think it computed with me that it was actually open 24 hours a day. Yes. That's amazing. That is some really cool information. Now, let's get back to you just a little bit because you kind of worked your way up through the ranks to become the general manager and have seen really literally every square inch of this facility through a number of renovations. Um, tell me about your um, career here at the Sanger. Well, I started out as a college student before the theater was renovated, came down and did some shows with Pensacola Junior College. Uh, back then, there was no renovation had been done. The stage hadn't been used as a stage in years. The movie screen, of course, kind of blocked off the, the rest of the stage from the audience, you know, being the fourth wall. And that uh, led to uh, becoming the first full-time stage manager here at the Sanger in 1981. Okay. Uh, and... Uh, that was in the 70s then? I worked in the 70s, uh -huh. yes, as, okay. a, as a college student here before okay. the renovation. Okay. Then the theater closed for renovation. Right. And following that, I came on as the first actual full-time employee of the Sanger okay. as a performing arts center. Okay. And since that time, it has functioned as a performing arts center for Pensacola, not as a movie house. Mm -hmm. uh, and my career you know, started out really unloading trucks mm -hmm. uh, and then became you know, stage manager and then technical director and then operations director. And then somewhere I wasn't paying attention and became <laughs> the general manager. Yeah. But, but that, you know, that sounds um, a little more opulent than it is sometimes to be the general manager of the theater because, I mean, I know you have had to do everything from, like, during the renovation, I think some, some locks got messed up. You were, you were fixing locks and, and do, doing kinds of things that, uh, you know, an ordinary general manager might not know how to do. Is that correct? Well, general manager basically means that I fix things while I'm still wearing my coat and tie instead of being able to go and do that wearing jeans. Mm -hmm. so, so if there's something wrong, this is a small operation, if right. there's something wrong, right. we just have to deal with it. Yeah. And you know, if that means repairing a toilet, wearing a coat and tie, that's what we do. <laughs> the very first show, yeah. uh, September 26, 1981, right. after the renovation, mm -hmm. the Duke Ellington Orchestra was on stage, right. 
and there was a problem up in the rigging above the stage. So in my tuxedo, <laughs> I climbed 62 feet up and above the stage yeah. during the show yeah. and fixed the problem and came back down while the band played. And shook hands and enjoyed the big grand festivities, right? That's right. <laughs> well, that's amazing. And that in itself is such a gift to Pensacola and to the Sanger to have somebody that not only loves her, and I'm sorry, she is a, a woman. She's the, been the grand dame of of Palafox and of Pensacola for so long. But to be able to have the, the passion for the theater, and, but to also be able to fix the toilet when it breaks, um, I'll just speak for the entire community and say thank you for all your years of service doing that. Now, let's talk about um, going back. So we, we had the 1925 grand opening with the movie. Mm -hmm. um, in the 40s, some modernization, boxes coming off. Um, did this theater ever go into a state of any kind of decline to the point where its future was questioned? Well, like many uh, small towns, downtown areas, when the malls became a phenomenon in the late 60s and 70s, uh, a lot of the businesses downtown closed and moved out to the mall. Directly across the street from us was the Sears department store and the J.C. Penney department store. Uh, when they left and went out to the malls, uh, a lot of the other uh, businesses followed, uh, jewelry stores, uh, there was a toy store down here, there was a Newberry's down here, lots of small, um, you know, mom and pop businesses down here. Right. And a lot of those closed down, and downtown became a pretty scary place. Mm -hmm. I remember as a college student, this was a place that even college students were afraid to come to at night. Really? In the 70s? In the 70s. Mm -hmm. Uh, so the, the theater also followed that decline, uh, went to showing kind of second run um, movies that were, you know, low, low quality right, 70s right, movies. Right. Uh, and then finally ended up evolving into an X-rated movie theater yeah. for a period of time. That's a shame. Uh, and it, at that time they had taken all the light bulbs out and put in pink light bulbs we're not really sure why. Yeah, well. But that's the way we found the building in the late 70s when ABC theaters finally decided just to shut the operation mm -hmm. down. Mm -hmm. uh, they moved the general manager that was here uh, from this theater over to the new Plaza Cinemas, which okay. don't exist anymore, right. they're gone. Right, that was, where was that, at Town & Country? That was behind Town & Country. Okay. Yeah. Um, and the, uh, the theater was given to the city for a dollar. A dollar. I wish they'd have given it to me <laughs> for a dollar. How fun would that be? Uh, uh, the city's intention originally was to tear the building down and put a parking structure here. Oh, good plan. Um, <laughs> she says facetiously. <laughs> now, the, fortunately, there is a uh, Robert Morton pipe organ uh -huh. in the theater that was originally used during the silent movie days okay. uh, to accompany the, the films. And that organ still existed at that time and still exists today. Uh, and the American Theater Organ Society went to the city and said, we want the organ. And the city said, fine, take the organ. Uh -huh. you know, that, we and, have no use for the organ. Exactly. They were going to tear the building down, so why mm -hmm. you know, salvage sure. the thing? Sure. They didn't think it had any value. Mm -hmm. um, and not long after that, they went back to the city and said, well, we need a place to keep it. Uh, it, it, it's a big it's room. Big, right? Yeah, it's a big room organ. It, it, you can't put it in your living room because it's bigger than most people's living room. Uh, keep in mind. Bigger that, than yeah, the living room. Yeah. Keep in mind that the the organ is not the part you see that is played. Right. That's the console. The, the console. organ mm -hmm. is a huge array of pipes. Right. Some of them 32 feet long, uh, and others of them down the size of a pencil, mm -hmm. uh, and they fill two huge chambers uh, that are on either side of the front of the theater. Uh, so they went to the city and asked if they could keep that and keep the building. And that started the Community Affairs Board, which later became the Friends of the Sanger. And the Friends of the Sanger organization, along with the University of West Florida and the city of Pensacola, then renovated the building and made it functional in 1981 as a performing arts center. Mm -hmm. And it's operated that way ever since. And God bless every one of them that did that. Yes. And that's kind of where then you became the... the um, stage manager yes. at that point in 1981. Um, I came along in 83 as the first development director to help um, 
with community awareness and parties and fundraising because, let's face it, um, an older facility, I mean, it's on the National Register, right? That's correct. And so renovations, restorations are a continuous part of the deal, um, right? I mean, it's an older facility, or I, I guess at this stage of the game, it's maintenance. Um, but but an old building's always gonna need help, so there's always going to be uh, a need and room for citizens and, and people that are in charge of and, and care for the theater to take take care of it and, and provide funding and, um, and interest so that we can have this for, for generations. Yeah, a theater isn't a place that should be uh, preserved like a museum. A, a theater is nothing but a, a big structure. The, the, the heart of the theater is what goes on on the stage and what goes on in the hearts of the audience. That's the, the magic of the theater. It, it has nothing to do with all this technology. Those are simply tools. Right. You know, if you, if you want um, a hole, mm -hmm. um, you don't go in and just make a hole. Mm -hmm. You go to a store and you buy a drill. You don't really want a drill. Mm -hmm. What you want is a hole. <laughs> exactly. Well, a drill is just the best way to do it. Right. And if you want to inspire the hearts of a community mm -hmm. and uh, enrich their lives and provide a, a level of, of emotional um, connection in a community. Theaters are how you do that. Mm -hmm. And the Sanger has done that now in various forms right. uh, since 1925. In high quality ways yes. since, since the 70s days. You know, when I sit here in the theater um, on the stage looking back here, it's almost like when it's really quiet, it reverberates with this spirit of um, all the previous things that have happened here, the people that have gotten engaged in the balcony, um, the people that have had their first dates here, the, the people that have celebrated anniversaries, and, and but the, the magnificent performances that have gone on. Share with me and us some of the different uh, performers that have been here to put this all in perspective. Um, we've had some big ones, some great Well, ones. yeah, and I mentioned we opened up in 1981 with the Duke Ellington Orchestra with Mercer Ellington conducting. Uh, over the years, we've had Hal Holbrook, Lucille Ball, uh, Roy Clark. Um, Bob Hope came, didn't he? Bob Hope mm -hmm. has been here many times. Mm -hmm. um, we've had uh, a wide variety of Broadway shows, symphony, uh, opera, you know, we've had uh, symphonic people like uh, Itzhak Perlman oh, uh, gave a recital in here, uh, and that was an excellent show. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, some of the shows haven't been so great. <laughs> uh, we've had bodybuilding championships, and we've had dance recitals where all the kids just stood on stage and waved to their mamas <laughs> in the audience and they don't dance at all. They oh, look yeah. really cute. Yeah. Um, but, you know. It's memorable. That's memorable. It makes memories. And, uh, that's uh, part you know, of the spirit. Yeah. And that's one of the things I really like about the Sanger mm -hmm. is that it's not just a Broadway house and right. it's not just a, an opera house. Right. We do something for everyone in here. Mm -hmm. um, and that's one of the great things about working here, too. Yeah. Is is you never, we never see the same show uh -huh. twice. Never. It's never the same twice. Right, right. Uh, and it's been everything from little kids mm -hmm. to high school productions mm -hmm. and college productions and, and professional organizations. We've had some hard rock and roll. We haven't really encouraged that over mm -hmm. the years. Yeah, we don't the want to shake the really, plaster. Yeah, the buildings are a little too delicate for that. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's, it's been the home of the Pensacola Symphony for the last 30 years. The Pensacola Opera, when they founded, you know, this became their home. Pensacola Children's Chorus. Uh, and the ballet. The ballet. Uh, we've had things like the uh, Florida's Junior Miss Scholarship Program that's been in here. Uh, so it, it's been a little of everything over the I, years. Yeah, I remember one year, um, I think Southern Company had a, had a big meeting here and brought people in from all over the country. And every little nook and cranny was being transformed into some kind of an area for information and education for them. Yeah, they remember had a, that? a very large stockholders meeting. Uh -huh. um, and indeed, you know, the building did not have the additions we, we just added in the most recent renovation. Uh, so every little closet was an office for some right. executive right. and, you know, things that were normally room closets, you know, were high, 
company executives or telephone rooms mm -hmm. or you know, we had to add 25 telephone lines just for that day. Yeah, that's amazing. But now, okay, so in 81, it was open as a performing arts center. It was what, a $500,000 renovation, so it was Well, just... was, it was $500,000 from the University of West Florida. Mm -hmm. And we also had uh, community fundraising of about a million dollars. The entire renovation at that point cost $1.6 million. Okay. Um, and then the more recent renovation, just a couple of years ago, uh, was a $15 million renovation. Once again, the community stepped up and they raised money and also agreed to uh, participate in the local option sales tax referendum, uh, which funded a, a good deal of the renovation. You know, fu funny thing about that is um, standing out on the street corner um, with the placards encouraging people to vote for the local option sales tax. Um, people such as yourself, I know I was out there, I know Bill Greenhut was out there, Robert Dave Verona, and it was really fun to see some of the symphony people and some of us out there encouraging the community to support that local option sales tax, a penny, um, so that we could get some, some money to, to put into this magnificent facility. And, and having done that, let's talk about their free performances in here as well. As you said, it, it, the gamut is run here. Some school children have their first experiences here. We, we do about 20,000 children through here a year that come in for uh, various shows. The symphony puts on a, uh, an educational program. The opera puts on an educational program. The children's chorus puts on an educational program as well as a number of touring uh, theater groups that come in and do uh, shows uh, sort of that are specifically designed to coordinate with the curriculum in the schools. Mm -hmm. um, and those happen typically in January and February. Mm -hmm. uh, so we, you know, the city becomes a huge bus center down here as we have as many as 120 school buses riding around the downtown streets. Well, now we've got new, uh, as you said, it's not the, it's not the tools, it's, it's what is provided, but, but we went from a smaller stage because it was originally vaudeville. Talk about the, the people that, um, how they got in here and, and, and how the performers were in the 1920s. What was going on back here on, on the street back here? Well, the, uh, the original stage uh, was 34 feet deep and 71 feet wide with the opening to the audience about 43 feet wide. We call it the proscenium. And that was it. The outside walls went directly to the outdoors. Uh, now, in the 20s, when, people, when vaudeville performers were coming through, they basically brought everything they had in a trunk. Yes. It came off the train, and they brought it from the train station down here, and that was their backdrops or props or whatever they used. In fact, most theaters that were in a chain, like the Sanger, would have had a stock set of backdrops. There would have been a garden scene and a city scene okay. and that sort of thing. Yeah. And so you just had your choice as the performer of uh -huh. what was going to be behind you. What you were going to pick. Uh, and those things actually hung around in the theater until even into the 60s and then they just went away. We just, don't know exactly yeah. what happened yeah. to them, which is a shame. That is a shame. They probably had deteriorated to the point that you know they, the fabric was just gone. So when you talk about the original company that owned the facility, the Sanger Amusement, Sanger Amusement Company, yes. And they had how many facilities around the southeast? Well, the number varies depending on which historian you look at. <laughs> yeah. There were about 13 or 14 Sanger theaters okay. built. That they actually put their name on. Okay. But the Sanger Amusement Company actually ran at their height about 250 facilities. Really? Uh, in Pensacola, the Isis Theater and the Sanger Theater okay. were, were both run by the Sanger Amusement Company. Uh, the Isis Theater building is still there. It's at the corner the of corner. Palafox and Garden Street. Uh, it's now an office facility, uh, but the structure is still there. Okay. Um, and then there were um, other Sangers in the, in the chain set up about one day's travel apart so that a vaudeville act would be hired to say, start in New Orleans and then go to Biloxi and then Mobile and then Pensacola and make the rounds. Uh, they had uh, facilities that we know of as far uh, west as Texas. Mm -hmm. Texarkana. Uh, Texarkana mm -hmm. and up into Arkansas um, and through Louisiana, uh, Mississippi, Alabama, and, and Northwest Florida that we yeah. know of. Right. Right. 
Um, there are some others in the historical records, even uh, down into Puerto Rico. Really? There's one they talk about in Costa Rica, but I've not really found any real documentation of that one. Uh, I thought I was kind of a historian around here, and I didn't know that. That's amazing. Well, you know, and it, when you hear some of the history, though, you'll hear there were six or seven in the, in the Sanger chain, but you're saying there were a whole lot more than There that. were a lot more. There seemed to have been kind of uh, regions okay. that the buildings were kind of, and time frames that they were, were built in. Uh, there were basically three floor plans that they built. Now, there were also other uh, theaters that they absorbed the operation of. They okay. either bought them out, mm -hmm. uh, they're, they're undocumented historical stories, mm -hmm. and I'll say undocumented, being a good bureaucrat, I'm <laughs> right. not going right. to stick my neck out here, right. uh, of the Sanger chain and other of the larger chains going in and basically starving out the, the small mom and pop startup gotcha. movie companies mm -hmm. um, by you know, right. basically running their buildings for free sure. until the other group went out of business and right. then they bought them cheap. Gotcha. Uh, allegedly. Allegedly, yes. <laughs> That's uh, a good news word. They, they, uh, but basically they would go in and they would try to take over all the screens in a town. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, in the 20s, monopolies, right. that was the way you did business. Sure, sure. Uh, and that's what they were doing. These guys sounded like characters too, these Sanger brothers. They, they started, I think, in the, in the drugstore business. That's what we understand, uh -huh. that they were in the drugstore business, kind of got into the Nickelodeons, right. uh, and then moved into the movie theaters themselves, uh, along with some of the other you know, big chains right. in the U.S., you know, the Foxes sure. and, and those kinds sure. of, of uh, theater chains. Well, and I'm so thankful that they did because they had such a, an opulent style. They really seemed to want to make the theater, as you said, a place that was so magnificent to go into that, that then you could be put in a position to have that experience. Um, yeah, a lot of the experience was the room. Mm -hmm. It was going in and, uh, you know, imagine Pensacola in the 1920s. Right. There weren't a whole lot of opulent structures no. at the time. Uh, the most opulent things around were churches. Sure. Um, and there were a few government buildings that were impressive, on the outside at least, but then coming into a, a, a vaudeville movie palace like these, and these were very popular to build in the 20s, right. uh, with all the ornate effects, uh, some lighting effects, and remember lighting was new. Sure. Uh, and so, you know, that was, you know, watching the movie was just a part of the experience. Coming into the building was part of it. You right. know, there were, um, there were staffs here, and you know, on a mezzanine level, there's an area that used to have an ice sculpture mm -hmm. all the time that, you know, as the, the ice mm -hmm. melted, there was a, a collection really? you know, bowl. Uh -huh. And the story goes that people could go and get ice water oh. well, out, it was... out of cups, uh -huh. out of the common. Well, this was before people had um, hand sanitizer. Exactly, uh -huh. exactly. <laughs> and besides, not to mention, this building without air conditioning is hard for me um, to imagine, well, it's not entirely because I know there were times prior to the renovation and restoration in 2007, 2009 time frame where the original air conditioning um, was having a struggle. What that was um, the original ducts and wood and all kinds of stuff. The air conditioning that's in here, uh, they actually ducted through uh, the original ventilation system. Uh, when you look up at the, the ceiling in the theater, you see these basket weave looking ductwork oh, right. area up there. And those actually originally went into large exhaust fans that were on the roof. So that's part of the system. And so when they, when they added the air conditioning, they reused that wooden area mm -hmm. that they literally made out of tongue and groove pine uh, and incorporated that into the ductwork for the air conditioning. Uh, when they, they uh, in the 40s when they modernized the building, we talked before, right, right. Uh, there was a dressing room tower off on the side, the south side of the building, sage left, mm -hmm. uh, that they took over the dressing rooms and turned that into mechanical rooms for the air conditioning compressors and the fans and that sort of thing. Okay. And that was routed through. Well, that basic system remained until the renovation two years ago. So that was that big, ugly 
corner that we would see there yes. was all of that. That kind of urban blight uh -huh. mechanical <laughs> thing that we had on the side of the building for all those years. It sure looks prettier now. Um, yes. The way it was, um, that whole street has been uplifted um, as a result of that renovation. But what I was going to say is, so they really needed that ice water because prior to that renovation, I was here for a, a movie event. I think it was um, Winterfest had um, the Jimmy Stewart movie, It's a Wonderful Life. Right. And sitting down pretty close down here, in the winter, it was cold, right. really cold. You could, uh, it was one of those nights where the air conditioner wasn't working just right. right. And so can you imagine the heat in here in the 20s? Um, must have been hot. Or it, did it they really have was, like any kind of airflow? Or well, anything? just this, those exhaust fans on the roof mm -hmm. that pulled air out. And okay. then there were air intakes that actually ran underground here okay. that ran air through a tunnel that runs under the seating area. Mm -hmm. And that allegedly cooled it off. It would, today we would call that geothermal cooling. <laughs> uh, it was pretty ineffective. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, it is more effective in areas that are further north than here than it is right down here on the coast. Um, you, know, you can't really build much of a basement here to get the ground cooling that you need for that. And tour. why is that, Doug? Well, the. the uh, <laughs> why can't we build a basement here? Our current basement uh -huh. is 3.26 feet above sea level. Okay, that's not very high. Um, that's actually about two feet higher than that basement was originally constructed. Okay. Over the years, water kept seeping through the floor of the basement. And so they would pour concrete over that to make a thicker slab, and then a thicker slab, and a thicker slab. So if you go into our basement area now, it feels like there's a very low ceiling. Mm -hmm. Well, it's not really a low ceiling, it's a it's high a floor. High floor. Uh, so that area, which still has issues with water, mm -hmm. um, not really because of the sea level issue, well, but because there is a spring, an active freshwater spring, that runs underground under this building. Mm -hmm. Uh, if you're, you know, familiar with Pensacola at all, you know that there we have Spring Street. Spring Street, right? Has that got and, anything to do with our spring? And that is indeed the spring that, that uh, the head end of that spring was at Spring Street. Now that the head end is, is no longer visible anywhere, with you know the downtown having kind of taken over that sort of thing. Right. But the underground spring still exists, and we understand it outflows down on Pensacola Bay huh. uh, near the end of Ninth Avenue. That is so interesting. Maybe we could get a bottling company here and bottle the Spring Street water and, and use the money to continue to restore the theater with funds from Pensacola Spring Street water. Just an idea. Just an idea. <laughs> My mind's always working and thinking of ways that we can continue to, to keep people interested in, um, in coming to the theater, which is not up to any of us anymore because it is so grand now. I, I walked through with somebody after the renovation who said this is truly a world-class performing arts center now. It rivals um, so many of the of the great facilities. Speak to that. Well, most of these theaters, and this one in particular, were built with reasonably good acoustics mm -hmm. for the vaudeville acts. Okay. Uh, amplified sound really wasn't thought of when the building was built. Okay. Uh, the movies were silent. Right. So you didn't have to worry about that. Mm -hmm. You had a huge pipe organ to provide background music and some other instruments depending on what was mm -hmm. playing at the time. Right. At a small orchestra. Uh, and then the vaudeville performers simply had to belt out mm -hmm. and get over the, the Go noise the way back. Uh, of the audience. Mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, uh, the renovation we've recently done, uh, actually we spent a fair amount of money improving the acoustics of the room to make it better for live theater and for live music performances. Okay. Uh, when the symphony used to play in the Sanger, most of their sound was absorbed by all the stage curtains that were Just over their heads. kind of stayed right here so the audience didn't get the full effect. So uh, in the renovation, we added uh, an orchestra shell that surrounds both the, the above mm -hmm and the sides. We left the back wall as it is. It's a 22 inch thick brick wall and the acoustician loved it. Mm -hmm. He said, don't do anything to that wall. Mm -hmm. Don't put anything in front of it. Just make that the back wall. So indeed, that's what we've done. I love that word, acoustician. That's such a good word. <laughs> I'm just glad I said it right <laughs> this time. <laughs> you did say it right. Uh, mm -hmm. Now, the, uh, the, the effect 
that's different. Mm -hmm. um, if, if you go and sing in the shower, right. you sound glorious. Mm -hmm. If you go into your bedroom, your same voice doesn't sound as glorious as to you right. because your bedroom has, you know, Thanks quilting and, and right. carpet and that mm -hmm. sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Your shower, on the other hand, is all hard services. Right. And the same kind of thing happened here. We made hard services that surround the symphony. Okay. We changed a number of things in the seats where they have some wooden exposed areas that help reflect sound, uh, as well as some other things to the walls. and kind of made the difference of, of the symphony playing in your bedroom uh -huh. or playing in your shower, uh -huh. it really makes that much difference. Uh, and the symphony now is a world-class symphony and they sound great uh, in here. They're fabulous. And what a great way to explain that whole sound thing to us. So it's very important. Um, you know, a lot of times people don't realize how much thought and effort really does go into a performance. And, and the, the answer is quite a lot. Well, we really feel like we've done our job. If you don't notice any of the technology and you don't notice any of the things we've done, all we want the audience to do is come and experience the social value of being with a group of people experiencing the same phenomenon on the stage. Let's speak to um, the theater where she is today compared to just prior to the renovation and restoration. Are we seeing more shows? Are we having more people come in and get to be a part of the Sanger? We're having uh, a much higher caliber of show, particularly now. Obviously, the symphony has, has improved, and quite frankly, they're selling out all their performances, so obviously right. that's a great thing. The opera is selling out all their performances. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, Broadway series that we bring in, the touring Broadway shows, uh, are also selling out on a regular basis. Um, and we're able actually to bring in shows that we couldn't get prior to the renovation. We spent a, a fair amount of money, millions of dollars, yes. uh, expanding the areas that support the stage. The stage is exactly the same as it was in 1925. Right. In fact, the floor we're sitting on is the original 1925 the same floor. Yeah. Same wood, same right. everything. Yeah. Um, what we did was expand the areas that support the theater. And they're not glamorous. Mm -hmm. You know, it's loading docks right. and material handling things. Mm -hmm. Uh, dressing rooms, uh, which also are not glamorous no, spaces. Yeah, I would have loved to have done that, but, but you got to save money where you can. Right. 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 But they're uh, very functional and they're so much better than under the stage. Yes, the, the ones we had in, under the stage, uh, one of our performers once said, there's nothing wrong with these dressing rooms that a good coat of fire wouldn't fix. <laughs> uh, and Do you remember who that was? And it was Andy Andrews. Oh, okay. Uh, and the, the, uh, the, the uh, new dressing rooms, uh, our, you know, star quality, their Broadway uh, quality, they're all actors' equity standards, they're, they're excellent spaces. Everything they would need. Um, there was a period of time before this last, last renovation, we found out that we had been put on a list from the touring Broadway shows of places you don't want to play. Don't want to go there. Oh, because the dressing sad. rooms were so bad, the load-in was so bad. <sighs> you know, before the renovation, if we had to unload the trucks, they unloaded on the street, if it was raining, there was wet scenery and wet stagehands and, and the high risk of someone getting hurt moving all that heavy equipment. Yeah. Uh, for uh, you know, modern shows, that's just not acceptable. Right. For some of the shows we do, like the large operas, uh -huh. you know, they have large sets. Oh, uh, grand opera has grand sets. Right. And there's usually two or three sets for a, an opera. Right. So there are times in the past we had to take the set for Act Two, okay. and put it on the sidewalk. On the sidewalk during Act One, downtown Pensacola, and then mm -hmm. bring up the, the loading door at intermission and take Act One and put it on the sidewalk and bring in Act Two. And there are a number of times we had some really long intermissions while we dried the set off that had been out in the rain. And that's amazing. Uh, and now we have areas that are, are large storage areas in the back where we can actually store the scenery when it's not on stage. Uh, and that's made a, a huge difference in the quality of what we can bring in and, and really the numbers of people that can come and, and see shows here at the Sanger. I am so grateful that people got on board with this, the city got on board with it, the, the county got on board with yeah. it, the, the citizens, most of them got on board with it, and, um, and what it's provided is just vital. As you said, let's just say that we had not done the renovation 
and we didn't continue to renovate as needed, and maybe a facility in Mobile, and maybe a facility in Panama City or in Fort Walton were to renovate, as you said, we would be on the list to not be the place that anybody would want to go. And that's, that's exactly right. Yeah. Uh, bordering us to the east and west are, you know, the theaters about the same size. Uh, some of them are better funded than we are here uh, through various forms. Uh, so having really uh, a great theater with great facilities and a great audience that will come in and support the shows when they come in. Uh, you know, it's great if you can have a theater and have shows come in, but if no one comes and buys a ticket, then... This is true. You know, you know that doesn't continue long. We do call it show business, after all. <laughs> exactly. It is a business. So having all that uh, has made a, a big impact to our operation and our uh, ability to support the downtown area. You know, when the Sanger was, and what we talked about in the late 70s, mm -hmm. downtown was a scary place. And the Sanger was really the, uh, the keystone of, you know, that's what we need to hold on to downtown. We're going to put our eggs in that basket. And that renovation effort in the, in the late 70s and early 80s really spawned the redevelopment of downtown. And this more recent renovation has also spanned even more development in oh, restaurants huge. and uh, mm -hmm. nightclubs and things where people can come down here. And there's a very vibrant nightlife in Pensacola now, as well as a vibrant mm -hmm. uh, retail and uh, uh, office environment in the downtown area now. And that is directly attributable. There is no, there's no gray area there, I don't think, personally. Um, and seeing, for instance, when the theater was closed for the renovation, which it had to be, there were certain mm -hmm. things that, right, right. had to happen. Um, when it was dark at the Sanger Theater and the marquee was not lit up and there were not shows coming in and performers staying in hotels and eating in our restaurants and encouraging people downtown, um, some of the surrounding businesses had a little bit of a hard time for a little while, which we're very sorry that that happened, right. but look where we are today. Um, yeah, there was a period of time, as there always is, when you when you any infrastructure increased in a, in a community, you know, where you, where you fix the roads or you fix right. the, you know, that sort of thing. There's a period of time that that's rough, mm -hmm. uh, but the business down here hung in. Uh, they thrived uh, when we reopened. Uh, you know, the the Sanger brings uh, you know 100,000 people downtown every year, uh, on average. Uh, and a lot of those people do come from out of town. They come from outside the city limits. Uh, and they bring their money. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, part of the Sanger, I mentioned show business before, but part of the Sanger's mission uh, as it relates to being a city facility is economic development. It is to bring people into the downtown. It is to bring people with money into the downtown. Right. You know, Broadway show tickets in, in today's world are between 50 and $75. Well, people that buy those tickets can afford to go out to dinner. Right. Uh, and they do. They come downtown or they come to the related areas close to downtown mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, buy. People go to the right. mall and they buy outfits because oh, sure you have to, you can't come to the, the opera done. in yeah. the same, you know, so uh -huh. all that happens all right. and all that's a, an economic uh -huh. driver. Right. Uh, the, I'm not a big proponent of saying, you know, well, you did this much and therefore it had this much impact right. and the ripple right. out and all that right. kind of stuff. Right. Economists can explain that yes. better. Yes. I don't you directly just... understand it. <laughs> it uh, works. But I know that in a given year, we typically sell about $2 million in ticket sales mm -hmm. every year. Uh, and that's huge in this economy and sure this, uh, this community. Mm -hmm. uh, because in addition to that, people in need are, are going to go eat. There are people that come into Pensacola just to see shows. They gotta get gas. And if no other <laughs> thing, when we bring in a Broadway group, mm -hmm. we're putting 25 to 50 right. uh, hotel nights right. in right. every time there's a show. Mm -hmm. uh, so those are our important economic drivers, and that's really part of our mission as, as it relates to this building being a city facility. Sure. You know, the city is, is interested in economic development. Mm -hmm. The arts is a great thing to support, but we have to be able to afford it. And because we're an economic yeah. driver, that keeps the city support 
you know, for the arts and for the uh, entertainment values that we provide here. It all works hand in hand. Um, and just getting back one more time to not getting passed by anymore and, and the performers, um, I know that you have because you dealt with every single performer that came through here. Um, as a development director, I can remember we got in the show Evita when it was still pretty big and everybody, it was, it seems like it came, it was one of those where we got the call we're going to bring it in, and it was really quick. You know, I went and picked up the star performer, and I can't think of her name right now, in my little Toyota um, from the Pensacola Airport when it had not been renovated yet. And, and you bring these world-class performers prior to the renovation in here, and they're sitting down in dressing rooms, uh, Bruce Hornsby, their pipes right over their heads. It's just Lucille Ball with her little teeny measly um, dressing room that she had it you know honestly you, you go we've got this great facility here we are at Spensacola but you were a little bit embarrassed um, by what we could offer and that's not the case anymore when when these people from all over these well-known nationally known entertainers come in here now we can provide them with the best and that speaks very highly to Pensacola I think we can you know when the audience comes in the front door right and they see you know the lobbies and they come into the seating area and it's all opulent and it's all pretty that's great mm -hmm. the performer however uses the stage door right. and in the past they came in a little door and they went down a narrow stairwell that was it was so narrow that when we did operas some of the dresses wouldn't fit up the stairs. The ladies literally had to okay. flip their dress up and come up sideways up the stairs. Thank you for doing that, by the way. Uh, yeah. so, so that we could be entertained. You know, and now the, uh, the performers are brought into a nice area uh, where there's, you know, actual, you know, it, it looks like a hotel room quality environment. Now there's mm -hmm. not all the, the, the amenities of hotel, you know, that sort of thing. Sure. But it's a, it's a nice space. Mm -hmm. So when you bring in someone, you're not embarrassed, right. and their attitude is better when they come out to perform oh. because they don't actually see the theater typically until they walk on stage in front of the audience. Right. Uh, you know, when we bring in a touring act, they they perform eight to ten times a week. Mm -hmm. They don't need to come out and rehearse. Right. They come out and they just do their thing. All of their uh, support staff have prepared everything that they can can, can walk out. Right. Right. And literally, in some cases, they put little tape arrows on the floor that lead from their dressing room out to the <laughs> stage and then tape arrows that take them back to their dressing Make room. Make it really, really easy for yes. them. Yes, because, you know, they're going sure. from city to city sure. to city and, and one dressing room oh. looks the same. Oh, and, yeah. You know, very often you'll yeah. find they write on the edge of the stage in white tape, you know, they'll, they'll play Pensacola. Yeah. yeah. So, so they, they know what city they're right. in. So they so. go, Pensacola, yeah. Yes. Uh, Last so, night it was Spelunk. And, you know, in the past we also had issues like, I mentioned it's a Perlman before. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mr. Perlman uses crutches. Okay. Um, and in the past, the only dressing rooms we had were in the basement. There was no elevator. Stairs. There were those little narrow mm -hmm. stairs. Mm -hmm. uh, we actually built a dressing room on stage for his show. Yeah. So that he had a place that he could change. Mm -hmm. But it had no facilities. Yeah. It was just a, uh, a booth. I imagine he wasn't real thrilled uh, about that. And, you know, a, a wonderful guy and mm -hmm. an absolutely mm -hmm. outstanding performer. Oh, amazing. I mean, world class, right. no doubt about it. Right. Um, but you know, it was embarrassing uh -huh. to, to you know, say this man. Right. Uh, you right. know, at his request, we did build right. a wheelchair ramp behind one of the box seats, uh -huh. um, so that if someone attended and used a wheelchair, they could get to the stage. Because at the time, there was yeah. no way that a an audience right. member could get to the stage if they used a wheelchair, except to go outside around the block, mm -hmm. hop the curb, and then hop another step up into the building. It was not actually a, a, a rampable area. Mm -hmm. And now all that's been re, uh, yeah. redone. It's it's all accessible, including the old basement dressing rooms are now accessible by elevator. So all of that is is completely functional right. and and no one's excluded. Uh, exactly. Yeah. Uh, audience yeah. members can get from the stage mm -hmm. to the mm -hmm. uh, from the audience chamber right. to the to the stage, and the performers can also get in. So if you have someone that uses a wheelchair, they're not excluded from yeah. this building. Yeah. And as you mentioned, if you have a happy performer. I imagine you have a much happier and, and uh, amazing performance exactly. coming out of them. Exactly. I mean, they're human beings. Right, right. So if they've come in and into a depressing area that it doesn't feel like they're being, uh -huh. you know, nobody cares about them, right. well, they're not going to care about the show. Yeah. And indeed, you know, this has made a big difference in 
and that attitude and, and how they, they get along. Um, you know, we, and we've done things over the years to try to make it as Oh, best absolutely, we can. been over backwards. You know, a few years ago, we had the show Riverdance, yes. which of course, you've, you've, everyone's seen the Riverdance with the long line of dancers right. all the way across the stage. Uh -huh. Well, each one of those, you know, dancers mm -hmm. needs a dressing space. Well, our basement dressing rooms were so small, they weren't adequate. They, they, we couldn't fit all the people that are in the show in the dressing rooms. Uh, so we ended up in our parking lot that was to the south, where we've now added the, the new dressing rooms. Uh, we ended up renting two big construction site office trailers uh, and setting those up, tenting across them so it was all covered, right. putting walkways out there on sure. the, in the parking lot so they could get in their costumes mm -hmm. across. Right. Uh, you know, we even had to bring plumbers in and have them in the restroom with each one. So for the two days that they were here, we brought in all those trailers, we did all the plumbing, all the electricity, oh all gosh. the air conditioning to set them all up out there for a two-day show. And nobody knew that because they come in and they see it. And But that, is, you know, that would be pretty inefficient, I would think. I mean, in terms of using up manpower and the rental and everything else, and now that's all... Um, that's all self-contained and, right. and right. taking care of itself. And we're not asking these folks to go outside, you know, in our Florida humidity. Oh, yeah. Uh, and then come into the stage right. and look fresh and excited. Uh -huh. And even worse, to do all that dancing. Oh, yeah. And then go outside into uh -huh. the, the humidity and heat that, that we love here so much. Interestingly enough, it seems like that was one of the last shows prior to the theater closing for the renovation, wasn't it? It, it was one of the last major okay. shows we had, yes. Okay. and. And keep in mind, again, people watching in 100 years um, from pulling this out of the time vault, that this is um, 2011. Um, Riverdance is on its way back. Yes. I think we're in the third farewell tour uh -huh. of Riverdance. I was going to say, uh, um, allegedly, yes. there's a farewell tour. But they're coming back. They're coming so back we have season. a chance to redeem ourselves, right? That's right. And um, Ted Neely, when he was here for Jesus Christ Superstar, the um, first show after the renovation right. said to me, I remember this place when we came through the first time. And that was probably, what, 15, 20 years ago? Yes. When he came through. He said, I just can't thank you and the people at the Sanger enough. He said, it is a joy to play here. And he held his arms up like this. Yeah. Um, so he was appreciative. And I know you've seen that time and time again. I heard... Um, Oh, what was that show, Moving Out? Those guys were like, oh, yes. we heard this was not the place to come, but that you've proved it wrong. Yeah, even a couple years later, we're still having performers that come in and they're surprised because they, they either have read about the building, uh, <laughs> they've, the talked to their, they've talked to their friends uh -huh. who are also you know, out on the road touring. Right, it's a small... Uh, it, it's, it's a little community road. unto itself, and, and they, you know, they go from tour to tour, and they, you know, they remember things. Right. Um, and so we, we're working through the negative reputation that we have, yeah. uh, but it's, it, the word is getting process. out there. It's and, a process. You know, we've had performers like Ron White that have been here several right. times. Three times, right? Uh, yes. Yeah. And now, I mean, uh -huh. he felt comfortable enough, he brought his bulldogs in. Oh, did he really? Uh, yes. He's always talking about those yes. bulldogs. And Not he, that he I would brought, ever see him speak. He, he brought them in, but, uh, you know, <laughs> yeah. and, and had a great time. And he yeah. felt like very much at home here, uh -huh. which is what we'd like to see with the performers that they feel at home. Absolutely. What do you see for the future of um, the Pensacola Sanger Theater? I mean, we're coming up on, what, um, what anniversary? 87 or something years old? Um, putting us on the spot. 25 to 2000. 75 years. Or 75, uh -huh. so and we're... another 12. Yeah. Yeah, 87 years. Um, I think what we're going to see is uh, the touring industry is going to change a little bit as it, as it always evolves. Mm -hmm. Technologies are making some of the shows a little lighter. Okay. Um, which is good because the you know as travel costs are increasing here in this day and time, uh, the method of touring is going to have to change. Mm -hmm. um, in the near term, we'll see some smaller tours, smaller shows. The big extravaganzas are going to scale back a little bit. But that's okay because usually that means the quality of the performers gets better. I would think so. Uh, so we'll see a little bit of change there. 
Um, we'll see a little bit more regional and homegrown talent emerging that is not going to be so far out. Um, and you know, a few years ago, people were saying that with the internet, and, well, well, first with radio, right. and then with television, <laughs> right. and then with the internet, and the ability to download movies and those sorts of things, that's a you know, fairly new phenomenon as we speak today. Mm -hmm. um, this, they you think know, people are going to stay home, right? They think pe people are going to stay home. Well, people don't socially interact at home, uh, and social interaction is a critical part of our community, and I, I really believe that that will never, never change. Uh, people will expect a higher level of technology uh, and for that technology to be transparent, and I think we, we will see that. Uh, improving. Uh, we're actually in the process of, of uh, upgrading some of our lighting and things like that to make ourselves more really? uh, energy efficient. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, some of the, well, the lighting design of the theater, mm -hmm. you see the, the wall sconces and the chandeliers, and of course those are all historically accurate. They're those beautiful. are the original mm -hmm. uh, fixtures. I know. Uh, but there are technologies that we'll be implementing over the next couple of years that will make those more energy efficient and, and still maintain the same look. And the same uh, historical um, significance. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. That's very, very important. Um, so for those are some of the things we'll expect to, from the future. Yes. Um, and um, as you say, there's no experience that can compare really, um, I think, in this area. Um, if you were to get up in a, a plane and look down, and think of the, the experience of getting dressed up for the evening, coming out to the theater. Um, you've got lovely concession now. One thing we didn't talk about is the way the lobby was when I first came to work, when you came to work. People might not remember this. Yeah, the original Sanger Theater lobby was basically a roof hung between two existing buildings. Okay. Uh, they literally notched out the brick on either side of the, the buildings and then hung the roof rafters and put a floor underneath that it. Was it. It was a 22-foot okay. wide sloped floor that started right. at the sidewalk and came into the theater. Into the theater, to the doors. That was uh, it. That was it. With a lovely, lovely neon light. Well, even before that, it was uglier than it was in 1981. Okay. Oh, it was. Uh, in 1981, the architects okay. needed to do something with that space because it, it was, had no historical character at all. Right. Uh, it had simply been, that was the part that the movie theater people really liked to, to modernize. Uh -huh. Uh, when you're just running a movie theater, the inside of the theater is not that critical because you don't turn the lights on much. Right. Uh, the lobbies needed to be glitzy, mm -hmm. and there had been things with mirrors on the ceiling and All kinds of you know things. things right. The ugliest concession stand I've ever seen in my Honestly. life. <laughs> uh, and you know the whole building kind of smelled like rancid popcorn butter. Oil. You know yeah. it was it not was good. yeah. So in that renovation 1981, they, they pulled all that out of there and they put in, a, we'll say, an artistic element okay. where they tried to use a modern representation of some of the ornamental motifs that are in the theater. Uh -huh. And Good the, concept. Uh, it was a great concept. Uh -huh. uh, that was up there from 1981 until 1995. Okay. No one ever got it. No, nobody figured that out. Had to explain it to everyone that ever asked. <laughs> no one ever it. made the connection uh -huh. between that. The blue. The, the blue neon and the interior of right. the theater. Wow. Well, yeah. uh, so in 1995, we uh, acquired uh, some additional space. We tore out where the offices had been, which originally was a separate storefront. Uh, and we tore down the existing, or the old lobby and that storefront and created the new lobby that's there now, the two-story uh, lobby. We went from uh, a space that was about 22 feet wide and about 100 feet long to about 46 feet wide and are still 100 mm -hmm. feet long, but on two stories. Yeah, well, at one point in the early 80s, somebody said, hey, you know what? We could actually make a little bit of money if Cokes were sold and popcorn sold out there. So those, the, the long tables were put in, which if anybody wanted to get a Coke, you couldn't get through and to get into the theater, right? right? And the tables were set up on the slanted floor. On the slanted floor. So, yeah. you know, everything was was tilted. So you uh -huh. couldn't even fill the drinks up all the way because they'd mm -hmm. spill out the Back the in the day. Oh, okay. Now we're showing our age a little yeah, bit. But yes. that's, that's part of what I wanted to do. Is there any 
other element or, or thought that you have about the Sanger that you just want to share or have we kind of kind of sum that up? A good funny story or just an anecdote that um, just doesn't need to remain only in your head? Well, the best story I have was from a season ticket holder, the lady that had Broadway season tickets. Okay. And she came and she said she needed duplicate tickets because she didn't have her tickets anymore. Okay. Um, and of course, we, we don't typically reprint tickets right. because of the fraud issues sure. and that sort of yeah. thing. But she went on to tell us that her husband normally kept the tickets in his coat pocket, okay. his suit coat, because he always he wore, the, he wore the, uh -huh. that same suit to the theater every time he came. Makes sense to me. Uh, he passed away. Oh, no. And they buried the tickets oh, with him. Oh, no, really? So, but she was still coming to the shows. Oh, so yeah. It was like, you know, well, he he's gone. he would have wanted her to. But he's gone, but, you know, I'm going to the shows. Uh -huh. uh, so she needed uh, uh -huh. another set of tickets uh -huh. for the rest of that season, which was... Uh, Best excuse yeah. you ever heard. You right? know, those are the kind of, uh -huh. of, of uh, fans we like, the uh -huh. ones that, you know, uh -huh. that come and, and enjoy uh -huh. and, and, again, you know, be with their friends and right. socialize. Right, and um, bring the family. Um, but that has got to be the best all time reason why you need your tickets. Yes. And, um, Doug, this has just been so fascinating and so fun. And so I hope for somebody watching that it's been um, an enjoyable hour that it's been informative, that you learned something about the Sanger that you didn't know before. I want to thank you for 30 years. Um, that's just been a tremendous gift to this community because you love the theater so much and it, and it shows in what you do. Um, what about, again, the future as we wrap this up? What can people do? Well, I think no matter where you're, you are in watching this video, whether it's you know, right after we film it or 100 years from now, there's still gonna be an opportunity for the community to support the theater. So I'd encourage anyone out there just to go ahead and, and take this opportunity and uh, you know contact the theater and see what they can do to help. Mm -hmm. So if they're watching it um, in 2011, 2012, 2013, you'll be here, the staff is here, and then in 100 years, somebody will be running it. So contact right. you and find out how they can help or be a part of this rich Pensacola history. Thanks, Doug. Thank you. It's been very fun. Thank you for watching and uh, come down and enjoy the historic and beautiful Pensacola Sanger Theater.